study and uh, you know th those words I love you could really change somebody's day yes. mm -hmm. telling somebody that they love them or, or letting yeah. you know when the Lord prompts you to say you know mm -hmm. go tell that person I love them yeah. those words can change somebody's day it can change their attitude it can change everything mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing how three simple letters three simple words can do that yes. just change somebody's day I love you in a place where this world we see no true love and those true things is you see how everything can just change our, uh, our attitudes it could bring joy it could bring laughter and it, it could bring so much and so it's pretty it's pretty awesome that he did that and um, we're gonna get right into the portion um, I have the, the, the opportunity to give the whole message today All right. and, uh, what's that the whole truth yeah, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And uh, it was uh, it's pretty interesting. You know, I've been studying all week and just really diving into the Word of God this week and, and really giving it my all and, 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 and just really diving in. And, and uh, it's I, I understand, you know, this is not just something light. I don't take this lightly that I just get up here and be able to minister and talk. I, I, I take it as something, you know, the Lord has has given me the privilege and opportunity to do. And so uh, I thank Rabbi and I thank you guys for allowing me to, to minister to you guys and speak into you guys' life. And uh, this, this is a great opportunity. And so we're going to get into our, our portion, which is Parshat Bayira. And it starts off with um, He Appeared. Um, our portion begins in, in Bereshit or Genesis 18, verses 1 through 22, 24. Our Haftarah is 2 Kings. 4, 1 through 37. And the Breed Hadashah reading is um, Kepha um, Beit, or 2 Peter, sec, uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 11. And it starts off in um, verse um, um, Parsha Fayira. It starts off with Genesis um, 18. But I, I want to go um, somewhere, a kind of a, a, a different route this, this, um, this morning. Something that kept on sticking out to me when I started studying and really getting into the, the word. And uh, it was, uh, you know, we read about Lot. Or low and uh, we read about him and, and we see a lot of different things in him and I see some similarities in him and Abraham and I'm gonna try to pull, pull out some of those things this, this morning and uh, really uh, share with the Lord was sharing with me and it, it was just a, a, a pretty awesome thing what, what I got to see so I'm gonna start with going into some of last week's text and um, I'll jump my way into this week's portion but I want to go kind of set a background and Genesis um, 12 Verse 4, it says, So Avram went, as Adonai had said to him, and Lot went with him. Verse 5 says, Avraham took his wife, Sarah, 
his brother's son Lot, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, as well as the people they had acquired in Haran. Then they set out for the land of Canaan and entered the land of Canaan. And so remember last week, I'm just going to lay a, a quick foundation of what we learned last week. Um, it says, um, remember that we, we see when the Lord said to, to Abraham in 12.1, it says, go from your land, go from your birthplace, and go from your father's house. And, and I asked the question, um, is why did God use this repetition to say, go, go, go? And I gave the answer. It says, if God would have said from your land or from your birthplace, it would have been enough. But the answer is that God was alluding to not only a physical journey, but also a to a spiritual journey. Therefore, from your land means from your evil inclination. From your birthplace means from the bad, bad attributes that you are, um, that are of your fleshly nature or your old nature. And from your father's house means from the habits that you learned in your father's house. So in, in um, that portion, we see Abraham is called the Ha'ivri, the Hebrew, a term that is used for one that has crossed over. We've seen that Abraham has crossed over from the idolatrous land, that land of ur Kazdim, which Rashi states as the land of, of that idolatry. And he crossed over, and um, we see this, and so um, the Hebrew meaning in this, in this regard is as the other, or a stranger or an outsider to the idolatrous world or culture. So Abraham is now uh, a stranger to the idolatrous world because he was called out from God. We see in the text from last week that Lot went with Abraham and that um, he was probably either tagging along or he was dragged along. <laughs> we don't see that he willfully wanted to go, but we do see that he crossed over. And I'm going to point out some things that he kind of, you know, was still in his old nature. Maybe he crossed over physically, but spiritually and mentally he was still in his old nature. And I want to point out some things that prove this in the text. That though Abraham crossed over, and though he was righteous and he served God and he went, you know, God called me, I'm going to do all these things. Um, Lot kind of like, well, you know, I'm crossing over physically. Here's the line that I'm crossing. But you know what? My, my heart and my attitude and everything that I am is staying behind. And when we cross over, we have to understand that it's not only a physical journey. That our spirit, our soul, our mind, everything that we are has to cross over as well. So we've got to be renewed as a new person. Not be of the old man, but of the new man. Amen. So in Genesis 13, um, 5, it says, <clears throat> Lot was traveling with Abraham. Also his, uh, he also had flocks, herds, and tents. But the land could not support their living together because their possessions were too great for them to re remain together. Moreover, um, quarreling arose between Abraham's and Lot's herdsmen. The Keniani and the Prezi were then living in the land. And Abraham said to Lot, Please, let's not fight. Let there not be fighting between me and you, or between my herdsmen and yours, since we're family. Isn't it the whole land? Isn't the whole land in front of you? Please separate yourself from me. If you go the left, I will go to the right. If you go to the right, I will go to the left. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Yarden was well watered everywhere before Adonai destroyed Saddam and Amora, like the garden of Adonai, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zeor. So Lot chose the plains of the Yarden for himself, and Lot traveled eastward, thus they separated themselves from each other. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan, and Lot lived in the cities of the plain setting up his tent near Saddam. Now the men of Saddam were all e were evil, committing great sins before Adonai. Mm. So we see that, that Abraham probably had a, he felt obligated to take his nephew. He might have felt obligated because you read his, his brother had passed away, so he probably felt that, man, I need, to, I need to raise up this kid. I need to train this kid in the way he should go. I need to help raise him. I need to help get him his life together and, and kind of raise him to be in, as an example as well to, to others. And so I want to bring him into the, the, the calling and I want to bring him under that covering and that covenant that God has placed upon me. 
So that's what we like to do. When, we, when God calls us, we like to go to our family and we like to bring them into the covering of God as well. We like to bring them out and we like to, to help raise them. We want to help do, you know, make them become not, not just something great, but something great in the presence of God or something great in the kingdom of God. And so we see that, that Abraham hath that in him to, to bring his nephew under that covering. To say, you know what, God has some promises for me, but I want you to be a part of it. We see this, and we see that, that though he might have crossed over his mind, like I said before, his mind and his attitudes were stuck in the old ways. We see in this text that Lot looked up and he saw with his carnal eyes the land. We see that he looked up and he said that, man, in his eyes, in his sight, in his own presence, man, this, this is the place I want. He saw with his eyes. He said, this is where I want to be. This is where I want to go. Um, Hashem was giving um, an, ever, uh, an eternal hope and promise to Abraham, but Lot was focused on the right here, right now. Um, a rabbinical commentary says that wealth and the lust of more, and the lust of more of it, brings out the worst in people. Abraham resisted it completely, but Lot allowed it to wrap his, ju his judgment until, as, as of course the succeeding passage indicates, it destroyed nearly all of his family. It began when there was insufficient um, land for their abundant flocks. This caused Lot's shepherds, with his support and his um, convenient rationalization, to resort to thievery. Petsitka Rabasi comments, that the land was surely spacious enough to accommodate two families. Rather, the source of the problem was that the fighting between the shepherds, and when people cannot get along, even the most spacious land is too small. Yes. Lot's dishonest shepherds grazed their flocks on other people's pastures. When Abraham's shepherds rebuked them for this, they responded, but God has promised the land to Abraham, and since he was childless, Lot, was to inherit the land. However, the verse specifically negates this uh, connotation by emphasizing that the Canaanites and the Perizzites were still in the land. Abraham had, yet, had not yet become the legitimate owner, Rashi states. And we read in the scripture that they were still in the land. So Abraham didn't become the full owner yet. He was still, God was still giving him, getting ready to him for the bigger picture, the whole promise. In Job 11, 20, it says, But the eyes of the wicked will fail to find comfort. They will find no way to escape, and their hope will turn to complete disappointment. Proverbs uh, 17, 24 says, The discerning person focuses on wisdom. Therefore, they're before him, but a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. Yohanan 1, 2, 15 says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If someone loves the world then love of the Father is not in him. Because all things are of the world. Because all things of the world, the desires of the old nature, the desires of the eyes, and the uh, um, pretensions of life are not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away, along with its desires, but whoever does God's will remains forever. So we see Lot, though he crossed over, with his uncle, his heart was fixed on his old ways, and his old nature. He was slipping or going backwards. He was caught slipping. Notice that when you go backwards or fall back into old mindsets and habits, it leads you back into captivity. Yeah. Yeah. We see in Genesis 14, Lot was taken captive when the kings surrounding the nations went into battle. The Midrash notes that the invaders took Lot captive because of the relationship to Abraham. They put him in a cage and boasted, we have captured Abraham's nephew. As the verse implies, he deserves, he deserves his fate for he was, residing in, uh, he was residing inside him, having chosen of his own free will to leave Abraham and associate with wicked people. According to Sephrono, they reckon they reckoned that the wealthy Abraham would be ready to pay a stiff ransom to free his nephew. The Zohar explains that Abraham was a, a target of the kings because he weaned people away from idolatry and taught them to serve God. Also, God in, incited them to this course so that Abraham would defeat them 
and thereby become a respected, um, thereby, thereby become respected, so respected that people would be attracted to his teachings. And I, I, I kind of, you know, you read this stuff and it's kind of amazing because it's true. Wherever um, Abraham went, wherever he traveled, whatever land he went to, you see that he became even great in that land. He accumulated more things, and even though, you know, he said, you know what, this is my sister, and this is, you know, uh, call me brother, call me sister. We know the, the story, we know how that goes, and how it ends up. It didn't end up well for him, but the hand of the Lord was still upon him. Yeah. And the reason why I see the hand of the Lord, Lord upon him is because when God called him out, we see that he obeyed God all the way through. He followed the voice of God all the way through. And I see Lot. Though he followed um, Abraham, and, and though he followed, um, was following Abraham, I seen him kind of following his own inclination. He was following his own way. He said, you know what? Maybe in his mind he said, you know what? He's something great. My uncle's something great. But I don't want to be, I don't want to be a part of my uncle's thing. I want God to do my thing, a thing in me. <laughs> you ever had that? Where God, I don't really want that, but I want you to do something. So you kind of separate yourself. Yep. You separate yourself and you find yourself outside. And so we see Lot, that he, he separates himself. And Abraham, you see the pleading. Hey, you know, let's stop the fighting. He goes, separate yourself from me, please. You know, go whatever way you go, whatever way you choose, you go that, I'll go the other way. You see that? He probably can't handle it anymore. You know, sometimes we need to separate ourselves from people that, that you know what, you just, you know, it, I'm not saying you're a lost case or a lost cause, but, you know, for right now, I just have to pay attention to what God is, is doing. Yeah. What God wants to do in my life. That's right. And I can't have you or drag you along because you're just slowing me down. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we need to get rid of some things in our life. Not saying that just because we can't help them, they need to go to God. Right. What we find in Genesis, um, what I, after, excuse me, I'll go in a while. It says, after all this takes place, um, where is Lot? We see that Lot sets up his tent and he chooses the plane where he chooses. But he sets up his tent outside of Sodom. And it amazes me because God brings them out of a land of idolatry. Mm -hmm. But yet he sets up right around another land that's into the same kind of stuff. Wow. Yeah. He sets up once again in another, in another place. Maybe it's another land. Mm -hmm. It's not the land that he came out of, but it's another land. He's going to familiar things. Because it was in his heart not to change. And so he sets up his camp once again around some familiar things, things that he knows, things that he was so used to doing. And so he says, hey, this looks pretty good. It wasn't just about the land of my flocks. It was about, it was about me. Yeah. I could live pretty good in that land. Not just my flocks. Yeah, my flocks would, you know, that would be cool. But here, this is where I want to be. This is where the party's at. <laughs> so after all this, we see Lot setting up his, his camp. And we see that he falls back into captivity. You notice that when you come out of things, that when God brings you out, and God is trying to do a work in your life, yeah. but you really don't want to change, <laughs> so you set up camp around certain things, familiar things. It's kind of like, you know, I see kind of this attribute of, of, that Sarah had, that, that kind of Lot has. Well, God, I want you to do a great thing in me, so I'm going to help you out a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to, you're going to make my uncle great, but I know you're going to make me great too. So let me help you out, God, by setting up my own camp. You set up my uncle's camp, but let me set up my camp and make me something great. But make me great over here. I don't want to be a part of this. You can't separate yourself. You can't pull yourself out of what God wants to do. When God does something, he works in a body of believers. He doesn't work in, uh, he does work in individual lives, but it usually does it through a body. To a group of people that are going to help you, guide you, and direct you. See, a lot needed some molding still. He needed some direction. He needed somebody to say, you know what? Let me teach you. The Lord has taught me. Let me help you. Let me guide you. I see you struggling in some areas. Let me help you. But at this point, it was like, Abraham, I, I can't take it anymore. You just don't want to listen. You knucklehead. <laughs> you just don't want to listen anymore. <laughs> so we see... That he, he, gets, he gets captured. We see that he gets captured. And then we see that he's taken captive. And like I said, you notice a pattern. He's falling backwards. He, though he came out, we see him just a pattern of going back yeah. into the same mess. So he becomes captive. And then we know Abraham, his, 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 um, his, his uncle, 
He says, you know what? He gets his men ready for battle. He says, we're going to go rescue Lot. We're going to go fight these men. We're going to go save Lot. We're, we're going to do everything we can. He has 318 men versus five armies. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That is amazing. And so we see that he, by himself with these armies, conquered these kings, the kings of the earth. And he does this great thing and he brings Lot back out of captivity. A second time. A second time we see him coming out. So, um, backing up a chapter, we read that uh, about God's appearing to Abraham, and Abraham prepares a meal for his guests. So, um, I'm sorry, my notes are kind of out of order. <laughs> but um, so let me let me go back. We see Lot being cap um, taken out. We see him coming out of that captivity. But then, you know what? And this is verses 13 and 14. We don't read about Lot again until chapter 19. In our, in our Torah portion. We don't read about him again. And it kind of makes me wonder, where in the heck did Lot go? <laughs> after he was taken out of the, the land of idolatry, mm -hmm. and after God was trying to, you know, make him be a part of the, the whole blessing that Abraham was going to get, we see him separate himself and take off. Then he sets up, and he sets up by the, uh, Sodom. So he gets back into captivity. Mm -hmm. His uncle comes in. He says, you know what? I'm going to bring you back out of captivity. You see this the second time? And then you don't hear about him again until chapter 19. During this process, where in the heck did Lot go? <laughs> where was Lot? Party. <laughs> where did he go? <laughs> in Genesis 18, I want to um, get some things, um, set some things real quick. It says Genesis 18, 16. It says the men set out from there and looked over to Saddam. And Abraham went with them to see them on their way. Adonai said, should I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Inasmuch as Abraham is sure to become a great and strong nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by him, for I have made myself known to him, so that he will give orders to his children and to his household after him to keep the way of Adonai, and to do what is right and just, so that Adonai may bring about to Abraham what he has promised. Adonai said, the outcry of Saddam and Amorah is so great that their sin is so serious. <laughs> their sin is so serious. That I will now go down and see whether their deeds warrant the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Amen. You notice that every time, Abraham was always before the Lord. Everywhere Abraham went, every time Abraham um, um, did something, whatever he did, he was always standing before the Lord. The Lord doesn't just call you out and say, oh, you're on your own way. Go, find it, search for it. Uh, good luck with that. I'm calling you out. And this is what I want to do, but um, here's a map. Try to figure it out. He's not going to lead you somewhere that he's not at. He's going he's gonna to call you out, but he's going to lead you and guide you on the way. Just like the Lord is there before us and he's behind us. He's guarding us. He's all around us. He's going to lead us to that place where he wants us. He's not going to leave us high and dry, but he's going to lead us to that place. Abraham always stood in the presence of the Lord. No matter what took place, Abraham always stood in his presence. When... We read about that, you know, the kings came and said, hey, whoa, your, life looks pretty, your wife looks pretty good. Uh, I'm a taker. We see that God always had his hand upon that situation. No matter where Abraham went, the hand of the Lord was always on him. And so we see this. So um, Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Abraham approached and said, will you actually sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Maybe there are 50 righteous people in the city. Will you actually sweep the place away and not forgive it for the sake of the 50 righteous who are there? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous along with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shouldn't the judge of all the earth do what is just? It's, it's kind of crazy, this conversation. You know, the, the questions that he's asking God, are you really going to do this, God? Come on, 50 people, if there's 50 people in these cities, are you really going to do this? And he kind of gets, not 
you kind of see a little bit of arrogance. Come on, you're the just God. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm your friend. You call me friend. But you're also just, and I know who you are. I have this relationship with you now. Are you really going to do this? I said, come on. Adonai said, if I find in Psalm 50 who are righteous, then I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered, hear now. I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to Adonai. What if there are five less than 50 righteous? He said, I won't destroy it if I find five there, if I find 45 there. <clears throat> and then you see Abraham coming again. He spoke to him again. What if 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I won't do it. He said, I hope Adonai won't be angry if I speak. Mm -hmm. He keeps on coming to the Lord. He keeps on coming. Well, okay. Negotiation. Yeah, the negotiator. <laughs> He's trying to get that deal. So you see him coming again. He says, I hope you won't be angry with me if I speak. What if 30 are found there? He said, I won't do it if 30 are there. So you got to understand, he is kind of like in a negotiation right now. Guess who he's doing it for? For Lot. Because yes. yes. think about it. He knows, God, would you do it if 50 are there? Yeah. In the back of his mind, he's like, well, I know there's not 50. There's only really one. Right. There's only one that I want out of there. God, would you do it for 50? Come on, he's trying to bargain. He's trying to get that deal. And you know, when you get the deal, you get somebody, okay, I'll do it. You can work them down to go more. You guys never buy cars? <laughs> so he's, he's trying to bargain. He's trying to get this deal. He's trying to, let's go. Come on. Okay. And then he, God's, okay, I'll do it. He's being, he's kind of giving short answers. Now it's like, okay, if you find this, I wouldn't do this. But now it's like, okay, for the sake of 50, for the sake of 45, okay, for the sake of 40. He's going down. He's bargaining. Lot is on Abraham's mind. So he says, what if 30 are found there? He said, I won't do it for 30. He said, here now. I have taken up, uh, taken upon myself to speak to Adonai. What if 20 are found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I won't destroy it. He said, I hope the Lord won't be angry with me if I speak just once more. What if 10 are found there? He said, for the sake of 10, I won't destroy it. And you get, this is what really, you know, this, this scripture right here, it's pretty awesome. It says, Adonai went on his way as soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. So we pick up in, in chapter 19. And this is what really gets me. We see the pattern that Lot is in. These patterns of always going backwards. After he was saved, like I said, out of the land of idolatry, he sets up camp around another land that's full of idolatry and adultery. And so he's saved out of that. And guess where we find him? Back at the city gates. Yep. We pick up in 19, it says the two angels came to Sodom that evening when Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. And it, it really, you know, you study this, sitting at the gates, sitting at the limits, you see that he was somebody respected in that city. Because the elders sat at the gates. The elders of that city would sit at the gates and they would either greet people or they would turn away people. Or they would sit there talking, studying, whatever it was, whatever city or whatever pertained to that city. That's what they would do. A commentary says that this city was so disrespectful to visitors that they, the, the elders of this city sat at the gates and actually turned people away. Mm -hmm. That they said, you know what, we don't want nobody coming here. So whoever comes, Lot, this is your duty. Turn these people away. So Lot was at the city gates and he sat there and Lot saw them. He got up to greet them and prostrated itself to the ground. He said, here now, my lords, please come over to your servant's house. Spend the night, wash your feet, get up early, and go on your way. And they said, no. <laughs> you know what's amazing to me? I see the similarities of, of, um, of Abraham that maybe with his time with Lot, that he had some, some he, maybe, you know, he wasn't a lost case after all. Maybe he picked up some good traits while he was in the house of Abraham. Maybe he picked up some good things. Maybe he wasn't a total loss. Maybe there was something in him that said, man, there's still hope. There was something in him because he shows the hospitality that his, his uncle Abraham showed to him. Bringing them in, welcoming in guests, bringing people into that tent, cooking for them. It's like pressing. 
bringing people into the home, <laughs> welcoming people, and, and just, you know, being that host. And we see that with Lot. He picked up something, so he wasn't a lost case. I read this commentary this week, and it was by a, a rabbi from Chabad. It was interesting because he was just kind of like scolding Lot. Like, man, Lot's just a lost case. He wasn't even the kind of person that you would invite over for a cold drink. That he was just like, he was just beating on Lot. And I was like, man, dude, like, okay, we know he's bad, but kind of, you know, when I was younger, Lot reminds me of a little bit of me. I kept on falling back into some things, and I needed somebody to pray for me. <laughs> So I kind of see, I kind of have that, you know what, I, Lot's not a hope, a lost case because I kind of, you know, I can relate with Lot a little bit on some things. I'm going to, you know, you, mom, whatever you do, what you're going to do, serve the Lord, but, you know, I'm going to do it this way. <laughs> we see this, he, he kind of was a lost case. But, <clears throat> um, so Lot says, he said, he said, now, Lord, my lords, please come over to your servant's house, spend the night, wash your feet, and get up early and go on your way. They answered, No. We'll stay in the square. But he kept pressing them. So they went home with him. And um, he made them a meal. Baking matzah for their supper. Which they ate. But before they could go to bed. The men of the city surrounded the house. Um, young and old. Ev uh, everyone from um, every neighborhood of Sodom. And they called Lot and said to him. Where are the men who came to stay with you? Tonight. Bring them out to us. We want to have sex with them. Lot went out to them and stood in the doorway, closing the door behind him, and said, Please, my brothers, do not do such wicked things. Look here, I have two daughters who are virgins. Please let me bring them out to you, and you can do with them what you seem, what seems to be good to you. But don't do anything to these men, since they are guests in my house. Stand back, they replied. This guy came here to live. And now he decides to play judge for that will deal worse with you than with them. You see, Lot was a stranger to them at first. We see that he kind of camped outside the gates. You notice when you set up your camp outside something? I look at it this way. We look at the Lord calls us and we kind of make a, a line in the sand. We mark that line and, and, and um, you know what, th th this is the line. And I know I'm not supposed to cross it. So what most people tend to do is kind of just camp out at the line. At the line. Yeah. They're looking that way instead of turning around and looking towards God is calling them. And so when they fall back, maybe they don't fall back all the way, but they end up back at the line. And so they're messing or, or, or having fun looking at what they left behind. Mm -hmm. They're looking at the things that they maybe, you know what, I, I want to go back, but I'm not fully going to go back. See, we're supposed to run towards God, yes. not away from God. Amen. Even though we set the line, it's the line is there to show us, well, that's not where we're supposed to go. But I also want to be as far as the line as possible. Yes. So let me turn to God and let his presence draw me. But when you're not looking at his presence, guess what? You're being drawn back to the world. Yes. And so Lot set up his camp. He set up everything. And not only his camp, he set up his household, his daughters, his wife. He set up everything that he had. And it was facing this wicked city. Turned away from his um, uncle Lot. He set this up. And it says, then um, they decided, he, a lot, he cries out. He says, leave these people alone. And they said, we're going to deal worse with you um, worse with you than them. And then they crowded in Lot in order to um, get close enough to break down the doors. So these men were very eager to do what they wanted to do with these people. With these men. They were very eager to, to, to let, they were full of lust. They were full of their own desire. They were full of their own evilness to do what they wanted to do. It says that the Lord handed these people over to their own inclination, their own sin. So then they struck. It says, but the men inside reached out their hands, brought Lot into the house, and then uh, they shut the door behind him. Then they struck the men at the door of the house with blindness, both small and and great, so that they couldn't find the doorway. The men said to Lot, um, I want to stop here real quick. It's, 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 it amazes me that even in, in, in this blindness, that they were still pursuing their evil desire. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even in their wicked, even in their, in the, in the, I'm blind, but you know what? I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going <laughs> to fulfill the lust of my flesh. I'm going to fulfill this, this passion that's burning inside me. I'm going to fulfill... What's inside? I'm going to feed this, 
monster. <laughs> so it says, um, then they struck the man, uh, picking up in verse 12. It says, the house, um, the house, <coughs> so the men said to Lot, do you have any people besides yourself? Whomever you have in the city, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, bring them out of this place because we are going to destroy it. Adonai has become aware of the great outcry against them, and Adonai has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke with his son-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up and leave this place, because Adonai is going to destroy the city. But his, son, his sons-in-law didn't take him serious. When morning came, the angels told, uh, told Lot to hurry. They said, Get up. They said, Get out of here. Take your wife. Take your two daughters who are here. Otherwise, you will be swept away with the punishment of the city. But he dallied. He dealt it out. <laughs> Some commentary said he lingered or he thought about it. I mean, you got to be in some kind of state to say, to understand that these, these, these angels, these messengers are going to destroy the city. And you got to be stuck in some kind of state just to just kind of sit back and wait. Well, he kind of, well, is this really going to happen? Let's kind of wait it out. Let's, let's play out what's really going to take place. Let's see what's, gonna, what's happening. It says he, he, um, he kind of dallied, he kind of lingered. So the men took him by the hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters. And Adonai, and, and it says here that Adonai was being merciful to him and led them, leaving them outside the city. When they had brought them um, out, he said, flee for your life. Don't look behind you. And don't stop anywhere in the plain, but escape to the hills. Otherwise, you will be swept away. Lot said to them, Please, no, my Lord, here your servant has already found favor in your sight, and you have shown me even great mercy by saving my life. But I can't escape to the hills because I'm afraid the disaster will overtake me and I will die. Look, there is a town nearby. He still wanted to stay close. He said, Look, there is a town nearby. that I may flee to, it is, it is a small one, please let me escape there. Isn't it just a small one? <laughs> and that way I will stay alive. He replied, all right, I agree to, to what you have asked. I won't overthrow the city to which you have spoken of. He says, but hurry and escape to that place because I can't do anything until you arrive there. For this reason, the city was named Zaor, which means small. By the time the Lord had come to Zaor, the sun had risen over the... Um, Lot had come to Zoor, the sun had risen and over the land. Then Adonai called, caused uh, sulfur and fire to rain down upon Sodom and Amora and from Adonai out of the sky. He overthrew the cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the city, and everything grown in the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a column of salt. Genesis nineteen twenty six. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a column of salt. Um, Genesis nineteen fifteen. When morning came, the angels told Lot to hurry, but he took his time. I look at these things, and I think about these things, and I, I just can't help but to 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 really see what was going on in their actions. You see, when Lot's wife would look back, it was as if she was trying to freeze time. Or freeze those moments that she had in Sodom. She was trying to free, uh, freeze these things in her, in, her, in her mind. So the problem with freezing time is we also freeze our movement. We get stuck always looking back that we never truly move forward. The scriptures say, remember Lot's wife, Luke 17, 32. Her life was stuck in the moments of Sodom and Gomorrah, causing her to become a pillar of salt. The pillar represents the covenant that she made with herself to freeze the moments that she had. <clears throat> Lot dallied or lingered, and it caused his wife to do the same. What you do, what you say, what you, whatever it is, your actions, 
you always have to look behind you to see who's following you. Because there's always going to be somebody following you. See, when Lot made the decision to set up camp, he made the decision for his family. He made that decision for his household. What decisions are you making for your household that's also going to lead your family into a place of idolatry? Mm. Or maybe captivity? Or maybe even going backwards, going back into the places where God brought you out of? What are you doing for your family? What are you doing? What are you setting up? What are you establishing? Are you telling God, God, I want to follow the promise like Abraham? Or are you saying, God, you know what? I'm going to separate myself from this promise and I want you to do this in my life. What are you setting up for your family? What are you doing? We must always look ahead as Abraham was always looking ahead. And every time Abraham, um, uh, every time God showed up with Abraham, guess what? Abraham was always in the right spot. He was always in that right place. I think about, uh, you guys remember um, Thrifty? Mm -hmm. oh, Before yeah. it was writing? Yep. Good ice cream. Remember, yeah, the ice cream still thrifty. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> getting hungry now. Um, <laughs> you remember the, those doors? The old school doors? The, um, the, the first um, doors that um, opened? Automatic. automatic doors, the first automatic doors. You remember that you have to step on that mat for that door to open? Mm -hmm. See, if you stepped on the exit side while you were going in, that door wouldn't open. Mm -hmm. There was something under that mat. That, that when, you when you stood in that place, the door swung open. But if you stepped at the exit door, you were either going to get hit or the door wasn't going to open. One of the two. I see Abraham always standing on that mat. He was standing in the right place for the door to open. Lot positioned himself in the wrong places. The doors never opened. So he kind of did, you know what, what Sarah did. Well, God, you know what, I can't have a baby. So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to help you out a little bit, God. Let's, let, I'm going to give him my main servant. <laughs> Lot was setting up something for himself. Maybe he wanted to become great. Or maybe he was stuck in the, the land of idolatry. His mind was stuck in, in idols and all this other stuff. So he said, you know what, I'm going to make myself great. And I'm going to come to the city. We see that he had to have been an elder of the city for him to sit at the city gates. So we've seen that he was gaining popularity with the people. He was with the in crowd of that city. But we see that even after all this, he chooses to go and run. And he hides in this, this, this small city, and he hides himself in a cave. Even after God saved him, and, and, La, and his, his, his uncle prayed for him, he was still hiding. I think because it was the sin, the shame, the humiliation that he may have, you know, I can't go back to my uncle's house because my uncle's, I told you so. You should have just stuck with me. But he, was, he went, and he hid himself. And he, he hid in the cave. But we read on in, 20, in verse 27. It says, Abraham got up early in the morning and went to the place he had stood before with the Lord. Abraham always returned to the presence of the Lord. Amen. When, before he went to bed, guess what? He was with the, at the presence of the Lord. When he woke up early, guess what? He went to, that pre, to the presence of the Lord. He always made his way, no matter what he may have suffered, he always made his way to find the presence of God. And he looked out towards Sodom and Amorah, scanning the entire plain there before him, and smoke was rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. But when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and sent Lot out, away from the destruction. When he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived, Lot went to Zeor and lived in the hills with his two daughters, because he was afraid to stay in Zeor. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. It's amazing the mercy and the grace that God has upon us. Yes. That Amen. when he has, you know, the prayers of a righteous availeth much. Right. That when we have a righteous person praying for us, that, hey, God's going to rescue us. Mm -hmm. But there comes a point where we're going to have to make the decision ourselves. We can't always come up, hey, can you pray for me? Can you pray for me? Can you pray for me? Yeah, I could pray for you, but there has to be a decision in your heart that you need to change. Mm -hmm. Amen. We can't change you, and our prayer can't change you, unless you want the change. Yeah. So you have to stand up, and you have to position yourself. You have to say, I'm going to move my family away from these things. Yes, I let them. You have to repent, and you have to move away. Um, it says, Proverbs 4, 20, 25 says, Let your eyes look straight. Let them, let them look straight ahead. Fix your gaze on what lies in front of you, not looking behind. Proverbs uh, 23, 6, 20, uh, 23, 26 says, My son... Give me your heart. Let your eyes observe my ways. 
Psalms um, 141.8 says, For my eyes, Adonai, Adonai are on you, and you I take refuge. Psalms 119.15 says, I will meditate on your precepts and keep my eyes on your ways. Open my eyes so that I will see wonders from your Torah. Though I am just a wonder on the earth, a wanderer on the earth, don't hide your mitzvot from me. Psalms 119, 148. My eyes are open before the night watches so that I can meditate on your promises. We have to keep our eyes focused and not see with carnal eyes or the old eyes, but see with our renewed eyes in the promises of God that are only through our Messiah, Yeshua. So we have to be like Abraham. Where are we setting up ourselves? Are we being called out just to tag along? Go with the journey. Say, let's see where it leads us. Kind of tired of this land of idolatry. Let me find another land of idolatry. Where are we setting up? Where are we putting up our camp? Where are we taking our family? Where are we leading people to? Like I said, each of us could look behind. We look behind us, somebody's going to be following you. Where are we leading them to? Where are we, are we bringing them into the promises of God? Are we leading them into destruction and chaos? Where are we leading our families? Maybe we're mentors. Maybe we're teachers. Whatever it is, where are we leading these people to? You have to look behind you, and you have to evaluate where you are. And just like, like, like we see the similarities in Lot and, and Abraham, Abraham chose to be in the place where God was. Amen. Lot chose to be in the place where he wanted to be. And so where are you this morning? I ask you guys a question, and believe me, this message was challenging me. I had to ask myself the question, and I really had to take inventory. Yeah. What am I setting up in my home? Because ultimately, what I allow in my home is what I'm allowing in my spiritual life. Amen. What am I allowing in my workplace? What am I allowing in, in, while I'm on the street? What am I looking at that I'm not supposed to be looking at? Mm -hmm. You know, I have friends. I go visit some friends, and, and, and um, it's, <laughs> it's crazy because... They'll put on a movie, and they'll send the kids away. If you have to send the kids out when you're watching that movie, guess what? You shouldn't be watching that movie. I'm talking. It's, it's true. If it's not appropriate for them, it's probably not appropriate for you. And I had to learn that I need to get rid of some movies. I need to get rid of some things. I have to get rid of things in my life that, that are just... You know, sitting there, even though I'm, I may not be watching them or I haven't watched them for a long time, I can open up that cabinet and see them. And the temptation would be there to watch them. I'm not saying they have to be, you know, perverted, nasty movies. They could be just things that open the door to bring other things in. You know, I heard this story one time, and it was this pastor, it was pretty funny. He said that he was on a diet. He's going on a diet, and he's doing pretty good. Two weeks into the diet, he passed by his favorite donut shop. He says, you know what, I don't even know why I passed by there. He goes, I'll be honest, I, I wanted to smell the donuts. So he passed by there, he smelled the donuts. Guess what? He found himself inside the donut shop. Guess what he bought? He bought a dozen eclairs. Those are his favorites. He takes the eclairs home, he puts them in the refrigerator. He didn't eat them. His wife opened the refrigerator and said, what are these? He says, oh, those are just for me to look at. So... He would open the refrigerator one day. He had them in there one full day. He opened the refrigerator and he seen them. And then the Lord spoke to him. You can't set yourself up for this fall. Amen. See, his first wrong decision was walking past the donut shop. Amen. Then he found himself in the donut shop. Amen. Then he found himself walking home with some donuts. <laughs> and now they're in his home. The temptation is there. The things are there. We're living in very stressful times. Amen. Temptation, things, idolatry, it's all there to pull us away from the Lord. Yes. But we have to choose to set our eyes fixed on Him Amen. and be brought under His covering. Yes. This whole week and last week, and I was sharing with, with Deborah and, and a couple of other people in our Bible study, the Lord was really dealing with us with coming back under His covering. Not that we're crazy sinners and we left his covering, that we just like, abandoned him and said, God, you know what, forget you. We're going to be like, Lot, yeah, we bow. <laughs> but that there's certain things with our time that we should put more emphasis on him yes. rather than just, yep. you know, 
putting the emphasis on other things. Even with serving, we can come here and serve and do things and set up things, but we can still neglect personal time with the Lord. We have to set up that personal time with the Lord. It shows in who we are. Our character is developed during that personal time with the Lord. We have to spend that personal time with Him. And if we're not, we're just setting ourselves up to fall back into old patterns. I want you guys this, this morning, if we could take a, a minute or two. I, I, I asked my wife and my nephew if he could play a song. And my wife, if she could sing something for us. I know this is different from what we usually do. But in this time while they're up here, I want to take this time to really reflect and take inventory. And look inside of ourselves. Where are we standing this morning? Have we positioned ourselves, you know, in those, those old school doors? Have we positioned ourselves for those doors to open? Or have we maybe positioned ourselves somewhere else that we're just wondering, I don't even know how I got here. Today, we have the opportunity, and not just today, you can do it at home, you can do it wherever. We have that opportunity of returning ourselves back to the right standing with God. The whole purpose of, 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 of ministering and doing this is so that we can return back to His presence. And so, I, I just, I hope this song really ministers to you, it ministers to my heart. And I, and I just pray that we really just evaluate. You can stand, you can kneel, whatever you feel like doing, you do it. And you evaluate yourself and you come back to that, under that covering. Come back to His presence. Because that's what it's about, is returning back to the presence. See, the whole part of Lot, Abraham praying for him, was so that he can return back to the presence. But Lot kept on choosing his own way. We have the opportunity, whether we feel like we, we might be far off, we're not so far off that the Lord can't save. So let's evaluate ourselves this morning. Let's look at and take inventory. Let's get rid of some things and position ourselves in right standing with the Lord.
God, I pray that we're just drawn back to your presence, that we're drawn back into your covering, that we just want to be, God, lovers of your presence, lovers of all that you are. And I pray, God, from this day, God, that we just continue to move forward, God. As Ralph Shaw said, leaving behind those things, God, that kind of just dragged me down, those things that didn't really matter, those things that weren't pointing me or connecting me to Messiah. We just let these things go and move forward. And God, I just pray that we just grab hold of all that you are, all the promises that are yes and amen through Yeshua the Messiah. And we just grab hold of all of that, all of you are God, and move forward. We thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 You guys received that message? Yes. Yes. Uh, no, it was a little different, but sometimes different is all right. Yes. Amen. Yes. Um, I got the privilege of uh, doing the blessing. So, uh, Yevarechecha Yadonai Vaish Marecha Yeer Adonai Panavalecha Vikunecha Yise Adonai Panavalecha Beyam Selecha Shalom May the Lord Adonai bless and keep you May the Lord make his face shine upon you and show you his favor May the Lord Adonai lift up his face toward you and give you peace. From our Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Beshem Yeshua, Amen. 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 Join us. Join us in the back for um, Kiddush. May the Lord bless you and keep you And make His face to shine upon you And be gracious to you May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you May the Lord grant you His peace <speaking in Hebrew> Adonai panav elecha v'yaseh Lecha shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you And make His face to shine upon you And be gracious to you May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you May the Lord grant you His peace Yiverecha Adonai Yishmerecha, Ya'er Adonai, Benav Elecha, Vihunecha, Yisa Adonai, Benav Elecha, Ve'yaseh, Lecha.